Привет всем. У нас, ой, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit confused. Like I, I just picture this spoken Russian and I'm going to English right now. So we have the talk by Peter Kuznetsov, uh, the professor of Telecom Paris, uh, Institut Polytechnique. De Paris. Uh, de Paris. Yes, and uh, he will tell us the talk: a sledgehammer to crack a nut and why, why blockchain is not always a good good idea yeah, I, because i can't i can't see it's the, uh, it's, a, it's a long it's, and ugly it's, title it's i know an, yeah. yeah it's yeah. it's a long title good idea and what we can do about it um, so you want to explain why blockchain is good or why it's not no we, uh, you can see it's not always a good idea it's not it's, al yeah. so sometimes it is good sometimes it is good yeah, yeah. okay so it's, not, so, it's, it's not always a bad idea no so peter is an expert in in, not in blockchain, like what, what, what exactly? What exactly you're an expert in? Di uh, in yeah, no, I know you, 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 you're an expert in distributed computing, that's for sure, but I mean in the application to this uh, blockchain thinking. Mm -hmm. No, I, I like to think that I'm an expert in distributed algorithms, like the okay. algorithmic basics of distributed systems. And uh, yeah, this talk is about uh, algorithmics behind blockchain and behind applications of blockchains, principal applications. Of okay, uh, let's see the talk then. Well, thank you. Okay, okay so uh, uh, as Vitaly put, uh, this, is, uh, this is a talk about why blockchain might not be always a good idea. And, uh, uh, and well, we observe that it's uh, it's uh, sometimes overly expensive, and uh, and we propose some alternatives. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. I forgot to say some things that if you have any questions, please write into the chat. Uh, we had at least two pause points where we can ask the questions, ask the questions to Peter. So if, uh, however, if you have any questions, Peter is very happy to answer in, in interruption. So if you don't understand something, so, uh, do not wait while it comes to the point. Let's let's try let's try to stop and talk about what you don't understand. Okay, that's that's it. Yes, yeah, yeah. Please please do uh, pose your questions through the chat, and otherwise we're gonna, go, we're gonna have a discussion at the end of this uh, talk. Uh, we have to discuss some of the points in more detail. Uh, first, I would like to say a few words about my school. So this is, uh, my school is the part of the Institut Polytechnique de Paris, the Polytechnical in uh, Institute of uh, Paris. And uh, this is what uh, they call in other countries technical universities. It's actually a collection of uh, most prestigious technical schools of France. Uh, uh, Polytechnique, Telecom Paris, Telecom Sud Paris, and two uh, technological schools, ANSTA and ANSAE. And we have a master program and we have PhD program. So we have a doctoral school. So altogether we have like around 10,000 uh, students and about 15 master programs. So if you think about uh, applying for, uh, for a PhD or a doctoral school, uh, that might be a good place. Okay, so I, as I said, this is a talk about, um, uh, not about blockchains, but about applications of blockchains. But let's try to recall what a blockchain is in the first place. So you can see it as a, as a ledger, yeah, as a record of blocks of data, what they call in, a, in, in German Grossbuch. And here you, you have a sequence of blocks. We don't really care what these blocks are. It's uh, some blocks of information. Yeah. For example, if you talk about cryptocurrency, it's, it's a, uh, it's, uh, every block is a collection of transactions from account to account. So you, what you can do, you can add blocks to this ledger and you can read the ledger. So two basic operations uh, which you can have in this, uh, in this uh, data structure. Of course, we deal with a uh, collection of users. They have uh, access to this uh, record of, of blocks. And uh, we don't want to have a single point of failure, so we distribute it. So every user uh, stores its own copy of the ledger. And uh, of course, now, as soon as we have different copies of the same data, we need to replicate it and we need to synchronize it. And this might be a difficult task, especially when uh, some of the clients are 
malicious. They, they can try to act against the protocol, or for example, against the other users. And also, the system can be dynamic, so you can have processes joining and leaving. So you don't have a fixed membership of replicas, which creates another source of ambiguity and uncertainty. So again, from the algorithmic perspective, a blockchain is just a distributed data structure. So it has a linear record of blocks, for example, transactions. It exports two operations, append the block and read, read the state of the ledger. And uh, it's supposed to be consistent in the sense that every user should perceive the same evolution of blocks in this ledger. And should we all see the same sequence of blocks. And uh, this problem is uh, known for ages in the, in the theory of distributed computing. It's called the problem of uh, replicating a state machine. And we know that implementing total order of, of uh, changes in the shared system state, we need consensus. So it requires consensus, which is equivalent to implementing total order. Yeah, I will say a few words about consensus in a few minutes. What makes it difficult in the uh, area of blockchains and with the advent of Bitcoin that what became apparent is that we address this problem of implementing total order in a very hostile environment where we don't have static membership, we system membership dynamically changes over time. Uh, there are no Identities essentially, so your your the identity of a process of a user of the system. It's if it's public key, and you create as many public keys if you want. And uh, specifically, that uh, that creates the potential for the Sybil attack. So uh, Sybil is the, uh, this uh, phenomenon, the psychology of multiple identities. So the adversary, which acts against your protocol, may actually create as many participants, fake participants, as it wants. And uh, so, which means that any participant subset can be adversarial which overtakes all existing protocols which, which, uh, which we have now in the literature for solving consensus. So uh, the classical partially synchronous quorum-based uh, Byzantine fault tolerant protocols do not work. So Byzantine fault tolerance is, is exactly what we need in this kind of environment. The Byzantine fault in this language is, is a malicious fault where the faulty component of your system can arbitrarily deviate from its algorithm. Okay, so we cannot apply classical protocols here. So the uh, solution chosen by Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever uh, it uh, or she or he is or they, um, is uh, to uh, is very brutal. So what we do is we, we try to slow down the system. We uh, enforce uh, every participant who wants to change the system state to solve some very difficult cryptographic puzzle, which we call proof of work. So it's, a, it's a, some very, very core, very brutal, uh, uh, like uh, uh, brute force approach of solving a cryptographic puzzle, just to make sure that it, it, it is slowed down enough to make sure that every previous transaction issued, every previous block of transactions uh, issued uh, before uh, is, uh, is known to every system participant. Yeah. So by default, we assume that the system is synchronous yeah, with very long delay. And we make sure that the uh, producing a block is higher than uh, much higher than this uh, network uh, communication delay. So the throughput of such the system is low by design, but it's it's bad. But it's not the worst part. The worst part is that it it, it uh, this protocol consumes an enormous, enormous uh, amount of energy. So it's so uh, so not green. So it, it's it's amazing so that uh, people actually accepted such a technology, especially assuming that uh, uh, understanding that this uh, all these computations which uh, are take place uh, in uh, mining farms are virtually uh, useless. So Bitcoin consumes uh, uh, more uh, energy than Norway or Switzerland, and we I like to believe that Norway and Switzerland uh, they contribute more to the humanity than uh, than uh, blockchain. Oh, then Bitcoin, sorry, I should, I should say Bitcoin. Because there are different blockchains. There are blockchains which avoid this kind of technology. And we will say, we'll, we'll, uh, I will talk about this uh, a, few a few minutes later. So, uh, but before we, we uh, address uh, this problem, let's recall what uh, the original Bitcoin paper claimed. So first of all, they claimed that the uh, the the, uh, the problem they address is uh, the problem of double spending. It's a problem of uh, implementing a, a cryptocurrency system in, in which uh, no money is spent twice. Okay, and they insist that uh, to solve this problem we need a system that uh, makes participants agree on the single history of order in which the transactions were received. 
Okay, so they insist that consensus is necessary for solving this problem. And uh, well, the natural question is whether this uh, this is indeed true. And uh, well, the answer is no. I give you a spoiler. But before we go to this, let's uh, recall what consensus is. So consensus is a task. It's a distributed task, which basically replaces the notion of a function in sequential programming by a uh, distributed function, where you have a collection of inputs, one input per process, at, be at the beginning of the computation, and at the end of the computation, you agree on one of the inputs. Okay? So, uh, why consensus is an interesting problem? Because it's uh, universal. You can use consensus to implement a generic fault-tolerant service. As soon as a collection of processes can solve consensus, they can replicate any state machine. And in, in a way, repl a replicated state machine is what we understand as a blockchain. So the downside of consensus is that existing protocols, and actually any protocol, because we have theoretical uh, bounds uh, for consensus implementations, uh, are expensive and uh, cumbersome. So they're difficult to design, difficult to implement, difficult to test, and they uh, incur uh, significant costs, both in space and time, I mean, communication and uh, message delays. So, uh, again, coming back to the question whether a consensus is necessary for a cryptocurrency, uh, the answer is no, and the answer is, uh, was published in this paper uh, originally by Gerai and others, and it's called The Consensus Number of Cryptocurrency. And uh, the uh, message of this paper is that the consensus number of cryptocurrency is one, meaning that uh, consensus is not needed for solving cryptocurrency. And, in fact, this, is, this paper proposes a, com a couple of uh, asynchronous implementations for cryptocurrencies. Asynchronous, what I, I insist on the word asynchronous here, here because we know that there are no asynchronous solutions to consensus. So just to give you a, an intuition why it's true, let's imagine a transactional system. We have three users, Alice, Bob, and Carol. And let's say Alice issues a transactions of $100 to Carol. Bob issues a transactions of $100 to Alice. And uh, finally, Drake also sends uh, $100 to Alice. Okay? And imagine that T0 causally depends on T1, so meaning that uh, Alice uh, didn't have uh, $100 at the beginning uh, to send it to Carol. So it only sends uh, money to Carol once it re she receives uh, uh, money from Bob. Okay? So T0 causally depends on T T1. However, T1 and T2, they commute. They can, can be applied in any order. Yeah, because uh, they both send money to uh, Alice, and Alice can accept this money in any order. So we don't have to uh, globally agree on in which order these transactions are executed. Okay, so you can represent it as a graph of dependencies, and uh, this graph you can sort of deduce some partial order from this graph. You can see that T1 precedes T0 because T0 uses the money issued by Bob, and uh, T2 is unrelated. Okay, so you can extend this partial order to any total order by placing T2 in any place uh, in this in, in in the order t1 t0 okay so this gives us an intuition of why and how we can implement consensus less cryptocurrency so here we can relate each transfer of money between the accounts in the cryptocurrency system uh, to its causal causal past well, intuitively the causal past for a transaction is the sequence of incoming and outgoing transactions on a specific account executed by the owner of this account so make sure that, uh, if you make sure that the faulty account holder cannot lie about its causal past, for example, it cannot uh, issue one transaction and then issue another transaction without uh, referring to the previous one. Yeah? And we can actually solve this problem. We don't need consensus for that. So it's, it's, we can only implement this partial order, which in, in, makes sure that the order of issuing trans issued transactions per account are globally known. But about transactions of different accounts, we don't care. And the solution to this is based on the, what they call secure broadcast, or sometimes they call it reliable uh, Byzantine broadcast. So originally proposed by Gabriel Bracha and then extended by Malkin and Reiter to long-lived uh, online uh, broadcast systems. And this uh, kind of broadcast, they implement what we know as source order. We guarantee that messages issued by the same source are delivered in the same order by every other every process in the system. Yeah, but it, notice that then. Uh, uh, messages issued broadcast by different sources, we can deliver them in any order. Okay, as long as we guarantee source order, we are fine. And surprisingly, we can use it to implement uh, cryptocurrency. And uh, the uh, the more recent paper by Collins and others uh, shows that it, it 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 is not only that you can implement it; we can implement it in a much more efficient way than. Uh, 
consensus-based uh, systems, where you have some uh, graphs. I don't know if what you can see there, but uh, if you see that the y-axis on the left graph, it's a throughput, is logarithmic. And you can see that actually it's orders of magnitude you win by running a system based on, uh, uh, on different variants of secure broadcast, whether we use signatures or not. S uh, using signatures, using signatures sometimes helps because you can use very compact messages. You decrease the communication delays, but of course you in, in, uh, incur a little bit more computations. But for large-scale systems, actually, it's, it makes sense. And uh, in the bottom of this uh, of this graph, you have uh, a system based on uh, BFT Smart, which is one of well state-of-the-art consensus protocol used in the context of a cryptocurrency. On the left, you have also a discussion of uh, latency uh, versus throughput. You can see that the, uh, the good solutions, they have short latency and uh, for high throughput. Okay. Well, we stop here for, for a little moment. Like, if you have any questions, please ask right now. We are coming to the point that there is no, no reason for consensus, really, in the system. I have the question, though. Can you tell me, uh, what is the... Uh, how to understand which transactions depend on each other? So you 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 you, you propose like that in the in the system like there is a way to uh, to structure transactions in some order. Uh, is there any automatic way to do that or yeah, something like that? There are multiple ways. Yeah, I'm not going to discuss them in detail, but yeah, one brute force solution would be to make every transaction carry its causal past. So you just, whenever you send your transaction, you just also tell which transactions you base on. Yeah. Oh, and that's it. For example. Yeah. Uh, but is there any kind of automatic no, way in the sense that you, ju you just say, uh, please do this, do this, do this, and you, you, you should decide in which order you, you, you are doing this? Uh, who is you? <laughs> uh, that's a good question, by the way. <laughs> I have, to be, to be honest, I have... No, uh, you, there are better ways. Uh, maybe the, the, most, uh, the, the best way is to make it really lightweight and just to associate every outgoing transaction per, per user with some sequence number, mm -hmm. which should linearly grow, mm -hmm. and make sure that you use this secure broadcast to make sure that uh, nobody can lie about any particular sequence number, about which transaction you issue in this sequence but number. But if you have sequence numbers, you will get their consensus, right? No, in no. The, in these their... sequence numbers are per account. Ah, per account. They're not global. Okay, okay so it's this is exactly source order. This is source order, source yeah. order. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, there is a question by Evgeny Bikinin. Uh, source order provides truth about all participants' ca causal past or not? No, no, uh, per se it doesn't, uh, it, 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 it's, it doesn't care about causal past. It just says, uh, you, you, if I send transaction number one and then I send transaction number two, nobody can deliver these two transactions in, in, an opposite, in the opposite order. Mm -hmm. That's it. What I build on top of it, I can introduce some semantics, putting these semantics in the messages, and then you can use it, for example, for encoding the causal past. This, this can be done. But uh, what we need to the take out from the slide is that secure broadcast is just a primitive. Mm -hmm. Instead of consensus, you replace, yeah, replace consensus with secure broadcast. Yeah. Uh, okay. In a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then uh, you, you have a much, much more efficient and lightweight protocol. So there are no more questions right oh, now oh, anymore, okay, let's, so let's, let's continue. Yeah. Okay, so the, uh, given this idea, okay, but there are some interesting, important applications which can be done without consensus. And we know that consensus is universal for all applications. So the question is, can we think of, a, of, a, of an abstraction which could be also universal, but maybe not for all applications, but for applications of the kind of cryptocurrency? Sometimes in the literature we also say asset transfer, somehow it, it, it sounds more fancy than uh, uh, cryptocurrency. So we say asset transfer data type. So for implementing this kind of things like asset transfer, uh, can we think of something else? And uh, what, what I'm going to suggest is another abstraction which encodes some form of agreement, but it's an agreement not on the total order of events, but on a partial order. Uh, sorry, there is a question like which I'm not sure that I understand. Mm. So there is uh, the question, so how you provide part two from your slide? Part, part two, okay. Part two, yeah. I don't know. I don't understand exactly what is part two mm. here. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Let, let's move on. Uh, let's uh, maybe... After, can... after the next, after the next uh, stop, yeah, we will yeah, then yeah. discuss it. Okay. So the alternative to consensus, which I, I propose here, and it probably it's not the only alternative, but it's, it's an interesting abstraction, which is called lattice agreement. So lattice is a special type of partial order. It's actually partial order defined on a set of values for which you can define uh, a join operator. 
it's actually the least upper bound for any, any L set of elements in this uh, partially ordered set. Okay? So for example, the, the, the best example for, for, for lattice is the set lattice. So it starts with the region, which is the, uh, the, uh, uh, the empty set. And then you have a set of singletons, then you have a set of couples, then you have a set of uh, tri triples, and so on. So it's, uh, and uh, all these sets are related by containment. Yeah? And of course, for any set of elements in this uh, lattice, you can define the least upper bound, which is the union of these sets. Okay? So this is, so this is, this is a partially ordered set. Yeah, of course, we can see that, for example, you have some sets which are not related, so it's not total order. Yeah, two sets which are not related by containment, they are not related in this in this lattice. Okay. So uh, the lattice agreement is 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 a distributed task, a distributed problem. It's not really a task because it's a long long lived abstraction. So it has uh, a number of properties. Yeah? for example, it. It takes inputs and it produces outputs. So the inputs, we, we say them, they are proposed values and the outputs are learned values. Yeah? Take it as, think of it as a box. It takes input values and produces output values. First of all, we need to guarantee that regardless of the inputs, the inputs might, might not be ordered, but the outputs should be. Okay? So all learned values are comparable. Comparable in the sense of uh, this partial order relation. Okay? This is the first property, the, probably the most important property of this abstraction. Of course, the learned values should be based on the inputs. Yeah, they are not, uh, they are not uh, arbitrary. Yeah, so they, you don't take it from the thin air, you're, you base it on the inputs. So this is what we call a, a validity property. So every learned value is a join of proposed values. And finally, we need to make some progress. So we need to guarantee that if a correct process proposes a value, this value actually comes through. So it affects the system state. And this is what we understand as the liveness property of this latest agreement. Every value proposed by a correct process eventually appears in some learned value. So it should affect the values learned by other processes. Okay? So uh, to give you again the idea of total order versus partial order, so again, consensus is a total order. So if you have three consensus participants, if uh, one learned this sequence, the other can learn this sequence, and the third one should learn this sequence, so all of them, they observe the blocks of data in the same sequence. Yeah. So this is what we understand as a partially ordered sequence of uh, blocks. Latest agreement only implements a partially ordered uh, sequence. So, for example, for the same three participants, one participant can learn this sequence of states. Yeah, it states with, it starts with the with the black block, then it stays, uh, goes to the set in, which involves black and red, and then goes to the set which involves black, red, uh, yellow, and blue. Okay, the other participant can jump from the initial state to the final one directly, without actually knowing that the other participant went through some intermediate state. And the last one can actually start in the final state. So this is, this is all possible. Okay? And this is all okay with respect to the latest agreement specification. And what I'm going to show is that the latest agreement, it's, it's also okay for many, many applications. Okay, so, um, uh, okay, so I guess uh, this is a misplaced slide. I should have used it before. So f to give you a set example, yes, a set is, uh, is uh, this kind of set, uh, and the important thing is about uh, implementing set as a lattice is that you can also implement a remove operation. You can uh, insert operations, insert elements to the set. You can also remove elements from the set by uh, this artificial add uh, minus v uh, operation. And here we need to assume that the set is defined on uh, both positive and negative values. And now when you want to define the, st the state of, the, of a set, you need to uh, look at the all elements which were added, but then not, re not uh, later on removed. Okay. So this is what uh, we understand as a set, which can be actually put as a, as a parameter to latest agreement. Remember that latest agreement actually is abstract. It's universal in the sense that it, it applies to any lattice. And uh, like, for example, it could be a set lattice. It could be a lattice which, is, which might appear stupid because it, it, it is a partially ordered. So, uh, it's, it's a totally ordered set, which, which is actually a set of integers. But it's very useful, you will see why. So it's called the max register. It's actually a kind of read-write variable where every read returns the largest written value so far. Yeah? So here, the partial order is just the uh, less or equal relation. The set of elements is just a set of natural numbers. Yeah, the origin is zero. And the uh, union of two values, uh, x and y, uh, in this lattice is just the maximal value of these two. Okay, so if you have two competing values in your system, then the largest of them wins, in a way. Yeah? 
So uh, one important property of lattices is that you can compose lattices and the uh, composition of lattices is also a lattice. Uh, just because partial orders, they are composed in this Cartesian sense, as a Cartesian product, the, uh, the joints of two uh, elements of the partial order set is also uh, can be represented as a, uh, as a composition of two joints. And uh, yeah, and the, the set of elements is also the Cartesian products of the two sets. Yeah. So for example, you can take n max registers yeah, and see it as a composed uh, vector of max registers. And this composed vector of max registers actually gives us what we know as atomic snapshot. If you sometimes uh, saw in the literature the problem of atomic snapshot, this is exactly it. How to make sure that processes can update individual positions in the, in the memory, and with one atomic operation, take the snapshot of, con of the contents of the whole memory. And this, actually, if you look at this composed lattice, you can see that using the partial order defined on this composed letter, uh, lattice gives us the order of snapshots. Yeah? Either you can see everything. If I see someone, I see everything uh, uh, which, which uh, well, if, I, if I, uh, I see something and someone else sees something else, uh, either I see everything he saw or he saw everything I saw. Yeah, this, this is the uh, intuition of atomic snapshots. Okay, so you cannot have unrelated views. And atomic snapshot is, uh, is very, very popular in, in, in the literature because it simplifies so much uh, reasoning about distributed systems. Okay. Uh, sorry for that. I think I, I have uh, got another misplaced slide. So the, the, the message, uh, uh, the important message here is that uh, this latest agreement is an abstraction allows for efficient asynchronous implementations. So that was uh, an algorithm proposed by, originally proposed by uh, uh, Herlich, uh, uh, Rahman and, uh, uh, and Atiyah uh, for the shared memory. But uh, the most interesting implementations for us is, is the implementation by, uh, proposed by Falera and others uh, in the context of distributed message passing systems. So they, they, in, the, in the context of crash fault tolerant uh, distributed systems uh, where processes communicate by uh, uh, sending messages over asynchronous channels, you can actually implement uh, latest agreement assuming that the majority of processes are correct. Okay? And this interesting, uh, this implementation is in a way adaptive. So its time complexity is bounded by the, uh, by the number of co uh, competitors. So the, the, the more conflicts you can see, the longer it takes possibly to learn a new value. But if you have very few conflicts, yeah, in the, in the, if, if the, the, value, the values proposed by uh, different processes are already partially, uh, already ordered with respect to this partial order, uh, you don't pay the price of time, so you, you, you converge quickly. So it's, it's an inherently an adaptive protocol. And the, the, uh, this kind of abstraction is actually, it turns out that it, it is a perfect fit for asynchronous configuration. So let, let's recall well, I will, I, will, I will recall what the synchronous configuration is, but I will also, also say a couple of words about snapshots. So the snapshots is, uh, is a composition of uh, max registers defined uh, on uh, pairs of uh, sequence number of an n value. In, in a way, sequence number is a version of the value. And uh, the max register semantics here is, becomes handy because uh, uh, you typically look for the most recent value. So you look for a value with the highest version number. So to update the position in the, in the atomic snapshot, what you do, you read the max register, you write back the uh, a value with the highest sequence number. Yeah, just to make sure that the value you write in the specific position uh, has a hi highest version number. Yeah, to take a snapshot, you read all max registers. Yeah, that's it. So the snapshots are totally ordered because you have latest agreement. Yeah, latest agreement is already guarantees that the snapshots are totally ordered. Uh, you, you may have conflicts there in the way, for example, you have two different processes, they try to update the same position concurrently, so they use the same version number. But it's okay if you introduce some deterministic rule of uh, uh, resolving these ambiguities to, to break the symmetry, it's still fine. So this, uh, and this is how it's usually done in practice. You're, you're, for example, you choose uh, always the value of the process with smaller ID, if, you, if, you, if, the, if two processes write different values with the same uh, version. Okay, asset transfer. I claim that asset transfer can be solved uh, asynchronously, but I didn't say anything about latest agreement, but latest agreement is, yeah, again, it's a, it's a composition of a set latest. It's a, it's inherently, it's just a, every position in this uh, composition is a, is a set of uh, transactions 
issued by a specific uh, user for a specific account, if you want. Uh, each set is a state of an account, set of outgoing, outgoing transactions. Uh, to perform a transfer, you read the set, you check the balance of X, if the balance is sufficient in a way that you're, you have enough, uh, enough uh, money on your account, you just uh, add the transaction to the set, and, uh, and then uh, you propose a new state. So you propose to using the, uh, the latest agreement abstraction. Yeah. So the total order of sets, which is implied by uh, latest agreement, implies atomicity of transfers. So you're, it appears that uh, even though the, the system is distributed, different processes propose different uh, transactions concurrently. From the user's perspective, from the user of the, this account perspective, you, uh, you have uh, uh, atomic transfer operations. Reconfiguration. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a yet another application of uh, latest agreement in which uh, you want to keep the set of replicas where you store replicated data dynamic, but controllable. So you assume that uh, the users of the system, they are allowed to issue reconfiguration calls. So you want to, uh, whenever you want to, for example, anticipating failures or suspecting that some, some uh, set of replicas are, are, are compromised, you want to introduce new replicas and remove the compromised ones. Okay. How you do it, you have, uh, for example, you envision this, the, the two replicas are dead now, and the two users of this replicated service, they replace it with new, with new ones. Okay. Until recently, the basic solution to this reconfiguration problem was to use consensus. You basically agree, make the, all the users of the system agree on this system uh, state, on the number of replicas, on the set of replicas in the replicated system. Uh, and then, uh, well, it's actually interesting that the first proposal of this uh, in the system called Dynastore, proposed by VMware at the time, VMware Research, uh, they um, proposed an asynchronous solution to reconfiguration, which was really, really complicated and cumbersome, but it, it, it has some interesting ideas already there. And it, this protocol was proposed before the, the, uh, the uh, asynchronous uh, latest agreement protocol by Falera and others, so one year before. I think if they actually read the, this paper uh, in designing the system, I think they, they would make a much more elegant algorithm. So what is this uh, algorithm? We can think of a configuration lattice. So every element of the configuration is this, uh, carries a set of replicas, a set of quorums defined on these replicas. Yeah, sometimes you don't want to introduce these threshold quorums. You can say, okay, uh, you, you trust this subset of replicas more than this, and then uh, you can define it as, as you wish. And the other attributes, whatever you like to be a part of your configuration, yeah, the computing power, yeah, the, the, uh, the memory distribution, anything you want to say about your replicas. You can all ingrain there. What is important is that you can have uh, some uh, uh, partial order on these uh, configurations, and you have uh, a join operator on configuration. So for example, what it means is that you have two concurrent proposals of configuration changes. It is okay to merge them. Yeah, to put them together. And th this way you can have uh, uh, a joint configuration. Yeah. And it's okay, this should be allowed. And in, fa in fact, for example, you can just use a set of members as, as a configuration latest and, it, it, and this works. Okay, so uh, for example, yeah, you have elements of uh, the configuration uh, latest are of the type uh, plus two, plus one, plus three, and minus two, for example. So here it's, it's like a set with the remove operation. So uh, uh, replica two was first added and then removed. So effectively, the set of members in this configuration is one and three. Yeah? But we also keep a little bit of record of the history of updates. So the, uh, the partial order is just the inclusion. Yeah? The uh, join operation is just uh, a union. Yeah, the members are, are all added, but not yet removed elements. Yeah, and the quorums are all majorities of the members. Yeah, so you assume that the majority of processes are correct. So here we need to make some assumptions about the adversary. Yeah, it's important. So now we can introduce a reconfigurable, reconfigurable object. So let's assume that we have some object implemented already in our replicated service. And let's say we implement this object using a latest type. So we, we assume that the, we have this uh, uh, some object, for example, asset transfer, or a set, or a max register, or atomic snapshot, which is already maintained using lattice. And we consider a joint lattice of configurations and the object. And then we solve lattice agreement on this joint lattice. And surprisingly, we have a reconfigurable object in the end. So this is a very, very clean 
uh, definition of what your configuration is. Yeah, so every update should be installed in the quorum of each candidate configuration because we have a multiple config candidate configuration at a time, potentially. The system is asynchronous, different processes, they have different subsets of proposed configurations, but it's okay. Because temporarily they can actually introduce this, work on these configurations, they can change the state of the objects, but the fact that all configurations learned by this latest disagreement protocol um, are totally ordered implies that uh, you don't lose state. Whatever you do in a, in a subset of your configuration remains in all future configurations. Yeah. A new decided state of the object makes all preceding configurations obsolete. As soon as you guarantee, you learned a new configuration, all configurations which were there before, they are, they are not relevant anymore, and we guarantee that no client will be working on this obsolete configurations because it, a new configuration has been learned. And here we use an important quorum assumption, so we need to make guarantee that the configuration must be available as long as it is not obsolete. This is what I put here in the box. This is actually our model assumption. Here we need to be careful that the, uh, this protocol works under the assumption that the adversary cannot compromise the configuration before it gets obsolete. Okay, so that's, uh, it restricts the power of the adversary, which might be uh, not very realistic for some settings, but at least for, for we, in, in the, if, if the hypothesis holds, everything works. So this is, a, uh, this is a discussable point, so here we can stop a little bit later. So this idea gives us, uh, like the composition of an object lattice and the configuration lattice, gives us a way to implement a plug and play kind of configuration. You can uh, plug whatever uh, latticeable object you can think of into this algorithm and get a reconfigurable version of this object. Yeah, it could be a max register, a set, atomic snapshot, a conflict detector, safe agreement, asset transfer. Yeah, so it's, and there are a couple of papers which you might look into if you want to get more details. So the, and this approach works both for crash fault tolerance systems and also for Byzantine fault tolerance systems. And this is extremely important for the asset transfer setting. Yeah, because asset transfers, the, uh, the, these are the systems which are trivially implementable if you don't have Byzantine failures, but uh, very hard to implement if you have. Okay, let's come back to this permissionless asset transfer. I started with permissionless cryptocurrencies. I was talking about Bitcoin and the amount of energy it spends to, uh, to guarantee uh, safety and liveness. And so we come back to this uh, hostile environment where nobody, uh, no trust in the system is available. And uh, uh, so what we have so far is uh, the algorithms by, by Nakamoto, the algorithms by Ethereum, uh, where, uh, where you assume consensus and you use proof of work. And there are some ongoing uh, proposals which are not yet issue, issue, real, uh, implemented uh, of uh, using other mechanisms, for example, proof of stake. So proof of stake in theory, it's, uh, it's a very nice uh, idea. So you, instead of um, uh, trusting uh, entities with uh, a lot of computing power, yeah, the more computing power you have in the proof of work mechanism, the more power you have to change the system state. Here you trust the entities with uh, more stake. Uh, Assuming that you implement uh, a cryptocurrency, the stake is moving around, and the different uh, at any moment of time you have different processes having diff different users having different uh, stakes, different amount of money at their accounts. You can sort of introduce some voting, and you introduce some voting, uh, making the assumption that uh, the participants with a lot of stake they don't lie, which may be reasonable because uh, if in the first place if you're if, you're, uh, if you hold a lot of stake, you are interested in the system running correctly. And you don't want to break it. So, um, and there are other, there are proofs of space-time, uh, you can introduce synchronous networks, you can use consensus, you can use randomization, but this, this, uh, these are all protocols which are sort of assuming that consensus is necessary for implementing asset transfer, but now we, don't, we know that it's not necessary. So let's uh, think about this proof of work, uh, proof of stake idea, Having, keeping in mind that uh, we, uh, we don't, our goal is not to solve consensus. Yeah. Okay, and this is the, the comparatively recent uh, result which we came up with, uh, which is a permissionless and asynchronous. And asynchronous in this context, context means uh, it's uh, an implementation which doesn't use consensus as a transfer system. Okay, so how we do it? So the idea is to, instead of uh, using quorums as we do it in, uh, in uh, 
and in classical uh, consensus solutions or classical implementations of reliable broadcast, we use weighted quorums. So the quorums which uh, use stakes in the in the weights. Yeah, and then you whenever whenever you want to issue a transaction, you accept this transaction if it is validated by sufficient amount of stake. And typically, we have more than two thirds of stake. And if you think about it, assuming more than two thirds of stake, and if you assume that stake is static, yeah, and you have two transactions which assume the same, like for example, they try to use the same money and they they are, they are conflicting. Only one of these transactions can, can collect more than two thirds of stake, under the assumption that more than two thirds of stake belongs to the honest users, yeah, because any uh, quorums of two thirds should overlap by at least one honest user, and this user wouldn't accept two conflicting transactions. This is the idea. Yeah, what is the issue which we face here, which we didn't face in the consensus-based situation where everybody agrees on the stake? Everybody knows who, who has what for each particular block. Here we don't have this luxury. We don't really, different participants, they can perceive different distribution of stake in the system because the stake evolves, okay? How we measure the stake in any synchronous system. The second problem is how we face a dynamic Byzantine adversary because the adversary can actually try to compromise the uh, stakeholders. It can look, okay, look, this guy is, has a lot of stake, maybe I should compromise it. So here we need, we need to assume that, yeah, the adversary is, is adaptive. Yeah, to, uh, facing adaptive, ad uh, dynamic adversary is hard. So our solution was uh, to treat each stake distribution as a configuration and make similar assumption. To say, okay, the adversary is limited, is not compromising specific configuration before it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's obsolete. Uh, in a way that uh, you, we also have another new configuration in place, and then you, you can do this. Okay. In this sense, a transaction is now a reconfiguration call because you, are, you change the stake distribution. Each time you want to change the system state, you reconfigure the system. Okay. So in the use, reconfigurable latest agreement as a building block. Yeah, so it's just a high level idea. Of course, the implementation details are long and gory, but on the high level, what we do is we reconfigure the system assuming stake distribution as a configuration. Okay? So I will, I'm going to slowly wrap up. So I'm, I'm going to, uh, to discuss the high level, the big picture. Where are we? So what we do? We try to solve a very hard problem, which is uh, state machine replication, for example, in a very hard model which is a permissionless setting where no trust among the system participants. The system is asynchronous or very, power poor, uh, very poorly synchronous with maybe very, very large long, long delays. And you have Byzantine participants which try to compromise your algorithm. Okay? And the system is also has a large scale. Uh, well, the experience of uh, Bitcoin shows that it's, uh, yeah, the solutions exist, but they are very, very expensive, very slow. Very inefficient. So what we can do, what can we can do to address this, uh, this problem? We can either relax the problem, yeah, we, we, we don't have to solve the, the full-fledged problem of uh, state machine replication. Yeah, and for example, we can go for asset transfers instead of blockchains. We can uh, relax a little bit uh, conditions. We can introduce some multiple spending mechanisms. For example, we can allow multiple spending. And uh, in, uh, in the financial markets on the, in the globe, on the global scale, uh, this is actually accepted. You can spend uh, the same money multiple times under the assumption that it's, 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 it's publicly known and it's, uh, uh, it's not too much. And you, you can, if you put this parameter into your system, you already have an easier problem than just regular cryptocurrency. You can actually replace full tolerance or compensate full tolerance with accountability. And this is yet another topic. You can say, oh, maybe it's okay to violate safety from time to time under the condition that eventually you will be able to detect it. This is what we know as accountability, and there are some interesting solutions for that. So this is about relaxing the problem. Yeah, the alternative solution, well, alternative approach for, to this big question is to strengthen the model. You can uh, replace like asynchrony with eventual synchrony. You can assume that, okay, maybe there are no bounds on communication, but uh, uh, for, a, for, for finite periods of time, but then from time, there are some periods of synchrony, some sufficiently long periods when communication is synchronous and, and uh, for example, the bounded zone, okay? Uh, you can make stake assumptions like we did with uh, stake-based uh, cryptocurrencies, yeah? You can assume that the adversary is not able to do anything, it's, it can... It has some constraints, and for example, it cannot compromise uh, too much stake. Okay, 
you can introduce some trusts. Yeah, you can say that, okay, maybe you do, the system is not completely flat. You have some uh, clouds of trust. Yeah, or some processes can trust some people more. And uh, this brings the idea of maybe there are no global quorum systems. You, can, you don't know, uh, like old system participants, they don't share the same trust assumptions. But maybe some of them, they trust uh, some clusters uh, more and they, uh, you can have some, some clusters of consistency in your system. And you can use it. You can use it in a global protocol. And that gives you a lot of power, as we, as we already showed uh, in, in some recent work. Okay, so having said this, I do a little bit of publicity. So we have um, uh, a project, it's called the Innovation Chair, and it's, it's, it's industrially funded, but it's, it's uh, supposed to be a fundamental research program project. And it uh, involves different axes. For example, it, we are analyzing TLI synchronous cryptocurrency different, in different perspectives, like using uh, stake for commercial settings, using uh, federated trust, and so on. So we have uh, a study of accountability, uh, which actually started quite some time ago, but recently it, it received uh, a new twist uh, thanks to, uh, to blockchains, essentially, because in blockchains accountability is important. Yeah, you have uh, potentially misbehaving parties, which have very rational goals in mind. For example, spending the same money twice. And this, thing, this kind of things are easy to formulate, to define, and to, uh, uh, to defend from. You can think of reconfiguration, yeah, the, the system uh, can evolve and reconfigure it uh, without consensus. You, you can introduce decentralized trust assumption, what I call federated trust. Yeah, you, sort of, uh, you have double spending, but it's under control. So, for example, you can think of case spending asset transfer systems, where you can allow the same coin to be spent k times, but not more. And assuming that you put some bound on the amount of uh, money you can send per transaction, that gives you some control over the, uh, the flow of currency in your, in your uh, digital uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, security, privacy is a very important thing, uh, how to combine different blockchains, but this, this, this axis is not yet uh, fully addressed, so I, I'm not going to talk about much about this. So if you envision uh, doing some research, or if you're looking for a postdoc position, yeah, so, and you're interested in this kind of questions, uh, please let me know. And uh, before I complete, uh, just say if, want to say a few words about the whole idea of uh, maybe blockchain and maybe how it, uh, it can be treated in, in a more philosophical sense. So if you think about what is innovation, so what is the origin of innovation? And there is a very nice analogy which I actually picked up in a book by Robert Muzil on the... On, uh, uh, the book is called uh, The Man Without Polities, and one of my favorites. And he had this uh, interesting analogy uh, comparing intellectual work with, um, with a dog holding a long stick in its mouth and trying to pass through a door with his long stick. It doesn't manage because the stick creates some problems. And it, it tries this way and this way, it turns around, goes back, goes forth, and after like enormous amount of uh, efforts and attempts, it goes through. So. Thinking about an idea or trying to solve a, an intellectual problem is not much different from this. So it's very important to try different ideas, try different technologies, different algorithmic uh, techniques, before you find the best one, or uh, the one which is good enough. And uh, it's very, very important to have a selection of tools. So you, 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 there's no one universal tool. You have many tools. And uh, each tool has pros and contras. And the first thing you should ask yourself is uh, what is the problem you're, so you're addressing before you grab a tool. And then once you understand what is the problem, you can choose the most appropriate tool or collection of tools and combine it in the most appropriate algorithm. And this actually holds not only for, for uh, information technology, it holds everywhere. So you, you need alternatives. You need uh, uh, different points of view, different ideas. There's no one idea which, uh, which, which work, works everywhere. Uh, otherwise, we're going to face something like this. Yeah, we're going to have tacos on blockchain and everybody would be standing in line for that. Yeah. So we need, we need more things. And uh, with this, I will uh, stop. And uh, I guess I can uh, ask uh, for questions, but we can, uh, we can go to the discussion room and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, elaborate on whatever you like to elaborate on. OK, thank you very much. So yeah, let's wait why, why there, there are questions from the audience. I still not sure that I fully understand w about this proof of stake, right? Uh, how, wh when do you kind of spend the stake? Is this the 
is this only the application for accountability or this is uh, can be gener generalized to some other things? I, I think it can be generalized under the assumption that you're, uh, you have some notion of, um, of valuable assets in your system, mm -hmm. which is dynamic, which may change over time. Or maybe, maybe it can be also static. If it is static, if it doesn't move around, just having the assumption that more than two-thirds of stake belongs to the honest users is enough. You can do many things already because you're, yeah, whatever you change in the system state, you pass it through the stakeholders. If the stakeholders say yes, okay, fine, you fine, you, you can you can proceed, you proceed. So this way you can achieve safety in a static stake distribution system. The interesting question is when it's not static, when it's dynamic, it changes over time. For mm -hmm. example, cryptocurrency by default, by the very definition of the of cryptocurrency. The stake is move, stay, mm -hmm. stake, stake moves around, yeah. and here it becomes more difficult because you need to account for this. Uh, what is the stake distribution? What does it mean at, the at this particular moment? I collected votes from uh, enough stakeholders. Yeah, but in in this case, aren't you going to wait while everybody like the system stabilizes and then make a snapshot out of there? Uh, no, no, it's 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 actually you don't have to wait. Uh, yeah. No, no, it's it, it's actually yeah. Maybe I should should have emphasized it better. It's not about. Uh, freezing and waiting until everybody uh, completes their transactions, then taking a vote and then moving mm -hmm. forward. No, no, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it is dynamic. And here, we, this is exactly the point where we use this uh, asynchronous reconfiguration. The system can be reconfigured concurrently by multiple users. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it all goes together because we can merge the, this reconfiguration calls, in this case, the transactions together, in a new con uh, configuration and work in this configuration. And then, uh, you, we guarantee that eventually everybody who yeah, but you ha you don't have to agree on the configuration, no, right? No, no, you no, just, no. We just no. We live in this world where you can think the uh, this is these are these the system members. I can think these are these are the system members. As long as uh, as long as you can get afterwards by no, combining as, everything as, together. As long as either your set of members is a subset of mine or vice versa, we are mm -hmm. fine. Okay. And this I can guarantee. Okay, uh, so there is a question from Vitaly Saif. Could you please cl clarify the difference between asynchrony and eventual synchrony? Okay, asynchrony means uh, you don't have bounds on communication, and uh, which specifically means that in, the, in an infinite execution, the uh, communication delays can grow without bound, for example. Mm -hmm. They are always finite, but they grow without bound. Okay, mm -hmm. and that, that is difficult. For example, you can show formally that in this kind of systems, uh, consensus is not solvable. Eventual synchrony says, for example, there are different formulations, but one, one popular one is to say that the bounds exist, but you don't know them. Mm -hmm. And here, consensus can, uh, can you be can solved. You can consensus, yeah. But yeah, you, you can solve consensus. Because, because you can sort of optimistically assume that it's, it's one second, well, one millisecond, and then if you make a mistake, meaning that you're timed out someone and you receive the response to your request uh, uh, in a longer delay, you increase. You, you some, but this uh, is increase exactly it. FLP, right? FLP shows that uh, a, a, a consen asynchronous consensus is impossible. Yeah. Partially synchronous consensus or eventually synchronous consensus is what the paper which is called DLS, uh, Dolev, mm -hmm. uh, Lynch mm -hmm. and uh, Stockmeyer. No, I mean, this is exactly this question, that in asynchrony you can do the consensus, yeah. while in eventual consistency you can. Yeah, you can, That's yeah. Okay, uh, do we have any other questions right now or, sh or we will move to the discussion zone? I don't know. Normally it's, it takes 30 seconds. It takes 30 question. seconds, yeah. yeah. So like we will wait like some, some, uh, some time to get the questions. I mean, uh, by the way, uh, you have this, uh, you have this large lattice where, where you have inside the configuration of the whole network. Uh, isn't it too much? To okay, so so I, I put it under the rug. I didn't discuss complexity at all. Yeah, I, I only talked about computability. Uh, so the, uh, the latest, of course, any universal object incurs cost mm -hmm. because it's universal. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to anticipate all kinds of yeah, applications. Sure. And uh, yeah, we didn't study it in, in full detail yet. So we have some, and I will have prototypes of some implementations of latest agreements. So we're going to play with this and see what exactly you win by going this particular path. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not ready yet to, to answer, but I think, okay. I think uh, on the high level, it cannot be worse than consensus. It cannot be worse Can, than cannot. consensus? Cannot, okay. I think. Because it's, uh, and here I would probably recall this property of adaptivity. Mm -hmm. 
unlike consensus. In consensus, if you have two proposers concurrently, they delay each other necessarily. In latest agreement, you have two concurrent uh, proposals, they can actually... Yeah, but how count your complexity in this case? In the number of messages or in the size of the messages or like what? Yeah, well, usual metrics are time, which is uh, the amount of time you spend before you change the system state. Yeah, but you don't know the time here, right? Uh, you, you measure it uh, in, in, uh, in the communication delays. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're, it's mm -hmm. usually you're like round trip. Um, yeah, so you're, of course, you, you don't measure it in absolute time because the, the absolute time doesn't exist in asynchronous systems. And then it's, we talk about theoretical metrics. Yeah, sure. And then we have uh, communication complexity, how much data you need to spend to, uh, mm -hmm. to change the system state. Okay. And uh, these are theoretical, and then of course, once we implement it and we get some graphs, yeah, then we have throughput and all kinds of things, like measure, measure latency in, in the absolute terms in, in some realistic settings. So it's, this is, yeah, I'm not ready yet to say, but I, I hope it's not uh, prohibitively uh, expensive. Okay, so I think nobody has any questions because the talk was quite clear. Or, 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 or it wasn't or, understandable yeah, at most, all. Most like likely that, nobody understood anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like that, that's too, <laughs> I, 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 I would hope that everybody understood everything. No, no, but you, you're welcome to come to the discussion. Yeah, you're welcome to come to the discussion zone that we will start in five minutes, I think, or so. Uh, see you there. Bye. Bye-bye.